first time someone called me pastor, and I didn't wince internally and think, huh, really, uh, was on the streets of Durham. I was a street pastor in, in Durham, and what that meant was uh, every Monday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I would go out there with card tables, put up three or four card tables, and get out some camp chairs, and, and we'd bring out a home-cooked meal, and then whoever came, came. And 15, 20, 25 folk would just come out of the woods. It was at the intersection of a major highway and one of the major roads connecting Durham and uh, Chapel, uh, Rock, Chapel Hill. And so we would go out there every, every Monday, and those fellows who we, we had lunch with every Monday, they, they grew to see us as their pastors. And, and who was the us? The us was myself, David and Julie Peeler, they were married, and Sarah Hamilton. We would go out, the four of us, we were all going to seminary together, and we were trying to figure out if you go to seminary, you learn about the abundance of communion, that there is always enough when it comes to following Jesus. What's that mean when you're driving by folk who don't have anything? Now, how do we do this? How, how do we hold this together? So we, we were out there, and we would eat a meal, and then we would pray, and then things would happen. It's funny how when you ask folk, what can we pray for, and, and they have a need right then and there. Pastor, can we pray that it not rain tonight because my tent ripped? Yes, let's pray for the rain, and let's go find a tent, right? So things would happen, always. And uh, so myself, David, Julie, and Sarah. Julie and I have very similar personalities. A bent towards micromanagement, detail-focused, a little bit of a workaholic streak. That, that's Julie and myself. David has looked at me on occasion and said, man, that, that was Julie, Andy. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, it's kind of freaky. But uh, so, have, have you ever noticed that the person who frustrates you most is the person who's just like you? Yeah, something happens with your own family sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, that's happened between we, with Julie and I. We had a falling out, and, and I have no clue what the falling out was about. It's been 13 years now, and, and I don't remember how we fell out, but we just stopped talking to each other, and, and that went on for about two months. In two months, we just weren't talking, and it was a problem. I'd talk to, I could talk to Sarah about it, but Sarah would say, you know, you really just got to go talk to Julie. And I could talk to David about it, but A, David's married to her, right? <laughs> Can't really take sides there. And he'd say the same, you know, and Andy, you just you gotta go talk to Julie about this. So um, this went on for two months, and we kept on going out on Mondays, gonna to help uh, meet our friends and help them as much as we can. And uh, we kept, and we weren't making it worse. We talked last week about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a decision not to hit someone back. Like we weren't hitting each other back. We weren't like trying to hurt each other, but we we weren't we weren't talking. We were barely making eye contact. And, and then something amazing happened something powerful, something we did not see coming. These guys who we were meeting on the street, our, our friends, uh, the, the, these 20, 25 or so folks we saw on a regular basis, they said, you're our pastors, why don't we have worship? Asking for worship? Up till then, we'd gone out and we would share a meal with folks, but there were too many churches who would say, I'll give you food, or I'll give you clothing, or I'll give you whatever you need, but first you've got to come to worship. And so this sort of sense of worship was the price you had to pay to get to what you needed. And that gives me what I would call the theological heebie-jeebies. I, I, it ain't right. right? It's, if, if it's come from Jesus, it's got to be a gift. Worship is not the toll you have to pay to get to lunch. Right? So we, never, we weren't ever going to do that, but they're asking to have worship. Easter was coming. Okay, we can do this. So we started getting ready to have worship on, on Easter Sunday. And, and uh, we got a 10 foot by 20 foot uh, canopy. This is before those like easy pop-up canopies, like steel poles stacked together. And we, we built the canopy and we found a side road we could meet on. You could, it was about 100 yards off the highway on a back road we could use. We got permission of the, the owners of that property. So we pop up our canopy, and uh, I'd ask these Methodist women of the church I was a member at, I told them, I need an Easter meal for 30 people on the side of the road in two weeks. And they did it. It was amazing. So an Easter meal shows up at 2 o'clock on Easter Sunday under our canopy, and we start leading worship, and we have 20, 25 folk there, and uh, it was powerful. And we start doing what we do. Uh, David led the prayers and read the scriptures, and Sarah preached. 
And then Julie got ready to lead communion. And how do you get ready for communion? You confess when you have, how you have fallen short of what God calls you to do, and then you pass the peace. And when you're in there with a group of 20 folk, you can't exactly avoid anyone. We haven't talked, we haven't made eye contact for months, and here we are, and she invites us to pass the peace, and so we do the awkward hug thing, like make, and then it's time to serve communion. And she looks at me, and this probably was the first time we'd actually looked at each other in a while. She looks at me and says, Andy, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Thanks be to God. Right? <sighs> powerful, powerful moment. Things were happening there. Things were happening between Julie and I, and things were happening with, with the guys on the street, too. There was one couple, they stumbled in off the highway that they had not been uh, planning. We'd never seen them before. They walked in. They, ha they hadn't had communion in years, and they walked in for communion, and, and one of them stepped out to throw up because they were going into alcohol withdrawal. And then they came back in for communion because it was that important because they had found Jesus who had come on the street to them, so they come in for communion. And, and another guy... Uh, he comes up to us after worship and he says, Andy, we got, i got to go to rehab. I've got to get my life put back together. I'm tired of this. So he says, I've got to go to rehab. And I, I've worked it out. I can go tomorrow. I can go tomorrow. And what we had worked out on the street was this. We work as hard as you work. If I give you, and I just give and give and give, it doesn't solve the problem. But it, if you are working at it, right, this guy was working at it. If you work at it, I will work as hard as you work. And this guy had, from being on the street, had made the arrangements and done the paperwork so he could go into rehab. And I would go through hell to get that man into rehab. So we're going to get this man into rehab because he has worked at it. He wants to, to ch turn his life around. Okay, here we go. How are we going to do this? Jesus sent out disciples two by two. That's how we did things. We never went solo. Because you go so, you, you're doing poverty or street ministry and you go solo. That's another way of saying you're in trouble. You just don't realize it yet. And so the two of us have to go. David had class. Sarah had an appointment. Who does that leave? Oh. Julie and I. Right? We haven't talked for two months. We've just shared communion. And now we're going to go get this guy into rehab. We've got to do it. And so we take him to the building, we, we, we pick him up, we drive him to where we're going to go, and we show up, and he's got to do the paperwork. And it's not a guarantee he's going to get in until he's done with the paperwork, and so he's back there doing the paperwork. And so there, there Julie and I are, we're sitting there in like the worst version of a waiting room you can possibly imagine. Small, white, a little bit too cold, uncomfortable, pla black plastic chairs, no magazines, horrible music on tinny, horrible speakers, and you're just sitting there. Well, I guess we're going to have to talk to each other, right? And so we talked. More importantly, we listened. And we listened to each other, and Julie could tell me, and this is her story to tell more than mine, but she could tell me how uh, there was some baggage I was bringing up for her. Some things that she was bringing up from, from her past that were just, and she apologized for treating me like she had. And I could say to her, you know, um, I'm a recovering micromanager, right? And, and I, she's really good. I had never really worked with someone who was that good before. And, and honestly, she's better than me. She's amazing, right? And, and I hadn't dealt with it well. I had not dealt with how good she was. And, and so we, we, we got square with each other. And, and that weekend was powerful. That weekend was powerful. They, they own a, David and Julie own a cabin in the woods in North Carolina. And right before Fletcher was born, we went out there and spent a week in their cabin so we could see them again and spend some time as a family. It's just, I am very thankful for that, that moment of communion and that time together because it, it, it rebuilt something that was deeply broken. Paul writes to a church that is deeply broken. In 2 Corinthians, he writes to them, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from this human point of view. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Behold, everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. This is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. And so we are ambassadors for Christ. 
We have this ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors of what Jesus is doing. Last week we talked about forgiveness. Forgiveness is how we don't make it worse. right? Forgiveness is I hit you and you don't hit me back. And every time you decide not to hit me back is an act of forgiveness. And forgiveness is what I do for myself. You don't have to ask me to forgive you for me to forgive you. Because I'm going to forgive you because that's for me. That's so I don't get wrapped up in bitterness and pain and in the past. I forgive so that I can heal and move forward. Reconciliation, that's what's next. That's what it means to follow Jesus as Lord. Jesus is Lord, and so I forgive like he forgave, and then I rebuild. To reconcile is to rebuild broken relationships. So I rebuild and reconcile, because that's the ministry that we have been entrusted with, the ministry of rebuilding broken relationships. Forgiveness is the start. It's, where we, it's where, what we do so it doesn't get worse. But reconciliation is what comes next. Forgiveness takes one. Reconciliation... That takes two. You've got to have two people who are equally committed to it. To, I can't rebuild a, a bridge if you're not building from your, ha, your side either. Right? Rebuilding takes two. Julie and I both had to rebuild together. And so this process of reconciliation is confessing what's broken, turning away, repenting from, from what got it that way, and then rebuilding something that is healthier and holier. And the order matters, right? The order, when Paul talks about this uh, to the, the church at Corinth, notice the order. First, Paul points out that we receive the gift that Christ offers us. First, we receive that we are reconciled. First, we receive forgiveness. Uh, Jesus died on the cross out of love for you and gives you forgiveness and reconciliation and hope and peace. And having received that, then you can go offer it to others. Because if you try to do it under your own power, it just wouldn't work, would it? I promise you that if the order had been different, that if Julie and I had been asked to go deal with rehab and before we went to communion, it wouldn't have worked. Like, we're pastors, that's our gig, and we still hadn't figured out how to make eye contact and talk to each other. We had to go to the table together and receive what God offers us, then we could be reconciled with each other. But first, we had to receive what God offers. The, the order there is important. If you think you are not strong enough or wise enough to do, to do the work of reconciliation, you're right. You're not. Until you receive what Jesus, Jesus offers us. And then we offer to others what God has offered to us. But having received that, that peace and purpose and assurance and joy... Then we have something to give away, something to offer, something to build with. So this is a practical skill. We forgive, we don't make it worse, right? We, we don't hit someone back, and, and then we reconcile, we, re, we, we rebuild what's broken. And Jesus has some very practical advice for how to do this. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells someone, if you have been hurt, you go to them. You go to the person who hurt you. And if it works out, great. And if it doesn't work out, you bring someone, you go back. And if that doesn't work out, you go and you get a group from the church. And you sit down and you work it out again. You notice how persistent that is? Right? It's not, if you have been hurt, I want you to sit back and wait for them to come to you. Right? Just sit back and hope they figure it out. No, if you have been hurt, you go to them. And you go to them and you don't say, well, I tried once, isn't that enough? No, you go to them and if it doesn't work, you get the pastor or you get a, a trusted friend. You, you get someone, you go back. Right? And if that doesn't work, we're Methodists. We go to PR, right? Go to PPR and, and figure it out. We do not wait and let conflict simmer and fester. Got to be proactive about it. Right? So that's if you are the one hurt. In Matthew 5, it's, it's the, they're bookends of each other. Matthew 5, Jesus says, if you are on the way to worship, right? not just any worship, if you are on the way to make an offering, Jews made offerings three or four times a year, and what did they offer? Livestock. Right? This is not as simple as pulling out your checkbook and signing something. Right? You have to get livestock to the temple. And I point up for a reason. Because you go up to Jerusalem. And so if you're going to make an offering, you get your livestock and you start trotting up the mountain. And it, what Jesus says is, if you're on your way to worship, to make an offering, and you realize you have hurt someone, you stop 
And you go back and you figure it out. I mean, that's like being on your way to Christmas Eve service, being all dressed up and you got the kids all pretty and you got the grandkids who are behaving and realizing like a block from the church, realizing, man, I did something stupid. And saying, okay, family, we got to go back. I got to go get this figured out. Right? That is the level of commitment that we're, we're looking at here. Jesus is saying, if you have been hurt, you work it until it gets rebuilt. And you have, if you have hurt someone, you, you go find them. And so as a follower of Jesus, if I realize I've hurt you, I'm reaching for the cell phone to call you as soon as I realize it. As I, and as I pick up the cell phone, I should see your number on the caller ID. You might want to go grab Fletcher. He just ate it. I sh if I'm going to call you because I've hurt you, I should see your name on the caller ID because you're calling me. Hey, yeah, we do need to talk about something. Let's go sit down and figure it out. Right? That is the level of, of commitment that, that we are called to have. So you do it. You sit down. You, I, I've done something stupid. We agree we need to sit down and drink some coffee. What do you actually do? Like, what does it look like to reconcile? I, I have some suggestions based upon what I read in Scripture. The first of them comes from James. James 1.19 says, Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Right, the first thing I'd suggest, when you sit down with someone, if you've hurt that person, you sit down and you listen. And they're going to start telling you a story. And the story is about how you did something stupid. And what are you going to be tempted to do? Interrupt. And ask questions. Don't. Just listen. Listen until they've said their piece. Right? And if you're the person who's saying your piece, let me advise you to never use one word. This is the second piece of advice I'd have. There's one word you are to never use. And here's that word. You. Steve, can I pick on you for a second? If Steve and I have a falling out and I go to Steve and I say, Steve, I was really bothered by that, okay, yeah, we can work this out. If I say, Steve, you're a jerk, you, you notice how there's a different tone to that, right? It, it's, a bit, it's a big difference between saying, I'm bothered, I'm hurt, I'm confused, versus saying, Steve, you're a jerk, you don't care, and your work's no good, right? You see here the difference in the you? Right? If I'm gonna sit down and have a conversation, I will sit down and figure out ahead of time what I'm going to say so that I don't say you. Because as soon as I say you, it just goes off the rails. It just, it just goes sideways immediately. I've, I've done it. it. It's bad. Right? So first, let them say their piece. Thank you, Steve. Second, don't say you. It doesn't help. Third, you ever get into a, 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 an argument about whose fault it is? Who's to blame? All right? Okay, let's say you figure out who's to blame. Have you actually solved anything? Have you actually made it better? No, not really. All right? I would suggest it is far better to sit down and focus on what do we need to do now? All right? What is healthy? What is Christ-like? What is gracious? Focus on who's to blame and, well, great, you figured out who's to blame. All right? Not getting anywhere. Finally, fourth of my suggestions, I would suggest that this is going to involve changing your expectations. When Olivia and I got married, we both brought a set of expectations. I had expectations about who took out the trash. She had expectations about who took out the trash. What doesn't, it doesn't matter whose expectations were what. What matters is they weren't the same. And about seven years into being married, I, I just, I, had, I couldn't deal with it anymore. That are, ah, like we had to sit down and have a serious conversation about how to get the trash taken out. And we had to modify our expectations. How often is conflict and disagreement based upon, you didn't fulfill my expectations? Well, what are your expectations? You just have to sit down. You, Andy, you're, you didn't do what I thought a pastor should do. Well, what should a pastor do, right? Expectations, got to sit down and chew on them. Are they valid? Are they healthy? Are they reasonable? So those are some suggestions about what to do. And you might, think, well, you might find yourself thinking, but pastor, right? But pastor, what about the person with whom I haven't talked for years? Decades, right? What about that person that I just have, I, they avoid me, I avoid them, I haven't done anything, I haven't talked to them, I haven't spoken to them uh, for years, right? It's turned into your own personal Cold War. Anyone have those moments, the people, your own, your own personal Cold War? Right? What am I supposed to do about that? 
I say send him a Christmas card? Send him a Christmas card, here's what you do. You're right. I would love to have coffee if you'd like to as well. Andy. And you send it to him. And you send it to him every year. Right? Because you can't make them be willing to reconcile, but what you can do is send them a yearly reminder that your door's open if they'd like to. So, that, that's... What, what about... Um, but pastor, what if the other person won't admit there's a problem? You can't do much then, can you? I can forgive you, but if we can't have an honest discussion about where we both fall short, if you're convinced that you're perfect and I'm wrong, that really doesn't go very far, does it? Right? You can't fake peace. You can't pretend it's all great and just, right? You can't just be nice because it's just going to happen again. I can't make you rebuild with me. But pastor, aren't there consequences to our actions? Does, does rebuilding negate the consequences? Of course not. Right? If I go out and do something profoundly stupid tonight and, and I wreck that green box that I drive around, I, I'd have to sit down with Olivia and we'd have to do some rebuilding because I'd done something profoundly stupid. And we probably could rebuild. Olivia would probably forgive me, and, and, and I, I hope. And uh, does that mean the green box is, is still totaled? Yep. Right? There are always consequences. Reconciliation doesn't say there aren't consequences. Reconciliation is you can still be in a relationship even as you bear the consequences of your actions. Are, are there, do y'all have any questions? Tell, tell me, any, any butt pastors floating around there? But pastor, what about... Right? Any questions? Right? If you're struggling with this, I, I want to know. If you are struggling with this, please come to me. Let's drink some tea. Let's sit down. Let's chat about it. Because if I can help you figure out how to rebuild a relationship, that, that would bring me great joy. Right? It is what, what, that's the work. It's the ministry of the church. And, and as a church, we have a role in this. As a church, we are the people who do what David and Sarah did for Julie and I. We're the ones who say, you're right, that is a problem. Why don't you go talk to them about it? Right? Don't gossip, don't feed the fires, don't encourage people, just tell them, you know, you, you just got to go talk with them about it. I'll go with you. I offer that to folk on a regular basis. If you need to go talk to someone, I'll go with you, but we got to go to them. We just can't let this stew, let this simmer. My friends, the stories we tell matter. Right? If we tell stories about conflict and grudges and maybe even have a bit of pride in how long we've held on to our grudges, then, then we're forsaking the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus gives to us. We are called to tell a better story. We're tell, called to tell stories of forgiveness, of rebuilding. We're called to tell stories of letting go of grudges and of relationships rekindled. The most powerful story we have is the story of a father who sent his son to us so that we can rebuild a relationship that we're the ones who messed up in the first place. Jesus loves us so much that he came to us when we weren't even asking for it so that we might be brought back into the family. Forgiveness is where we start, but the ministry of the church is in reconciliation. The ministry of the church is rebuilding what's broken so that we can take tragedy and transform it into miracle. Not because we're so hot, but because Jesus is good. Thanks be to God. Amen.